This nugget is focused on sprint closing. Every, every story is complete. These are the actions we take to close the sprint. The first step is the sprint review where we do the show and tell, showing off the work completed, and we get commitment of done. Once the sprint review is complete and we have commitment of done, we then move on to our retrospective. Our lessons learned and our process improvement. And the key is we do these after every sprint. And the reason I stress that is a sprint is two weeks long. There will be pressure from the product owner, from the business owner, from management to say, these sprint reviews and these sprint respectives, they're happening too frequently. You're doing a sprint every two weeks. Why don't we start doing the sprint review and the sprint respective after every second? It's only two weeks. Let's do one a month. The answer is no. These activities, the show and the tell, the commitment are done, are critical after every sprint because otherwise without the show and tell and the commitment of done after every sprint, how do we know we're done? And chances are the product owner or management that's pushing you to do it more less frequently will say, yeah, okay, I agree. It's important to do the sprint review, but let's skip the sprint retrospective and only do it after every second sprint. The answer is no. We're doing lessons learned. We're doing process improvement. Scrum is about being nimble and fast and effective. So if we have a lesson learned from a sprint, it's critical that we spend the time immediately after the sprint identifying the lessons learned and doing the process improvement so that we can continue to be nimble, to be fast and efficient. So to be Scrum, we need to do a sprint review and a sprint respective after every sprint, not after every second or every third or every fourth, as you may get pressure from management or even from the product owner to try to focus more on generating code and less on rituals. Remind them that Scrum is very ritual light. The rituals that are defined by Scrum are critical to being Scrum-like. And the reason they want us to be Scrum-like is to generate fast, effective code. And therefore, without sounding like a broken record, it's important that we follow all of our rituals and support Scrum best practices. The last aspect that I'm going to discuss in this nugget is this thing called an introspective, which is an on-demand retrospective. So not only do I believe that the retrospective is so important that we need to do it after every sprint, I believe there will be instances where we have some lessons learned, some process improvement that is so critical that we need to do this on demand. Call a team introspective the second we're aware of any concerns, any issues, and deal with them immediately. Deal with problems when they come up. Don't post pro postpone problems because they're not going to get better. They're only going to get worse. As discussed, the sprint review takes place immediately after the last story is complete. So ideal, the second that last story, the last test, the last tick box on the story is complete, we ring a bell, we sound a siren, we flash the lights, we do whatever we need to do, and we kick off the sprint review. Well, that's probably a little impractical to expect everybody to drop everything they're doing and come running the second the last story is complete. But 
the theory remains. As soon as the story is complete, we run the sprint review. So my suggestion is on the daily scrum, when we're coming down to the last day, we identify when we think that last story is going to be complete and we schedule the sprint review. So the day before, so on day nine, daily scrum, we look at how much work is left to be done and we say, okay, we have two stories left outstanding. One story is al already well into tests. So in all likelihood, that story will complete by end of day today. We have about another hour of development left on the last story. We figure we have what, team, four hours, six hours, six hours, okay, of testing left. That means the last story should be done around 10 a.m. So let's schedule our sprint review for 10 a.m. The key is we do it immediately after because as I've said before, there is no prep, there's no PowerPoint, there's no elaborate show. There is really the simple show and tell. So who do we invite to this meeting at 10 a.m.? Anyone who cares. The whole team should be there, which of course includes the product owner and the scrum master. And if the only people who care are the team, the product owner and the scrum master, that's fine. But there may be others who care. The business owner may care. Often the SMEs definitely care. The SMEs were very involved in the writing of the stories. The SMEs were involved in the, the crafting of the definition of done. So the SMEs will often want to come to the sprint reviews when they have stories that they're particularly interested in. There may be business areas, users who want to come and get a sneak peek. There may be, there may be, there may be anyone and everyone who has any interest in the stories that are being completed or that have been completed in this sprint are welcome to attend. And the key is it's the stories and only the stories in the sprint that are part of the sprint review. This is not a time to review the product backlog. This is not time to re review the release plan. This is not the time to enter into discussions of what the next story should be. This is an absolute sprint review of what was done in this sprint. Where should it be held? In the team space. All those charts, the backlogs, and everything else need to be visible during the sprint review to simply show we are being scrum-like. And the main focus of our sprint review is the show and tell. It's hands-on demo. Typically with the developer, at the keyboard, but where appropriate, the developer is more than welcome to pass the keyboard over to others, to the product owner, to SMEs, or even to the business users to let them take it for a test drive. And if the developer in particular is driving, takes questions. Does it do this? No, it doesn't do this because that wasn't part of the story. Show me how it does the story specifically and it's the show and tell. The bottom line, the sprint review, is to secure agreement of done. We have the story card with the tick boxes, with the, the definitions. We want to make sure they're all done. We've done the demo. We've answered the questions and we have proof of done. 
we look at the product owner, we expect the product owner to give us a little nod of the head up and down, not left to right, nodding of the head up and down, and we get the, the big OK, the tick box that says definition of done is done, and the sprint review is done. The sprint review consists of these four main steps, but I have another activity that is absolutely critical as part of the sprint review. And this last bullet may appear to contradict to what I said a moment ago, where I said the sprint review is for stories and only stories. This is not the time to discuss the backlog. This is not the time to uh, discuss the release plan. This is not the time to introduce new stories. Agreed. The reason I say the sprint review is to develop new stories, and this is based on feedback either direct feedback from the show and tell, or probably more particular is the informal, the unexpressed feedback from the show and tell. So as the developer is driving and giving the demo, other team members should be on the lookout for the reaction of the product owner, the business owner, the SMEs, the other participants in, the, in this sprint review need to have their reactions monitored by the rest of the team. Are they looking very happy? In which case, there are probably no new stories. But if we see expressions of concern, they're scratching their heads, they're making notes in their clipboards, that is probably a direct clue that there's new stories that need to come up as a result of the feedback from the sprint review. So we don't actively go out and solicit new stories, but we look for reactions. And based on the reactions, the team makes notes of, hmm, that demo of story number 42 didn't seem to go over very well. When we were all done, everybody agreed that done was done. But just those reactions from the business users say there's, there's more to it. Let's make a note to ourselves to talk to the product owner to do some more investigation as to why there was such negative body language around the show and tell for story number 42. And that's our sprint review. How long should a sprint review take? The rule of thumb is one hour per week of sprint. So in my case, where I always have been using the example of a two-week sprint, the sprint review should be two hours long. Certainly no more than two hours. So you have to take some care during the demo, during the show and tell, the driving, that you don't get so carried away with showing off the features and functions of the first story in the sprint that we use up a significant amount of our limited time. We only have two hours in total for the 8, 10, 12 stories that are completed in the sprint. Therefore, we need to ration our time appropriately and get the sprint review done in two hours. And then immediately after the sprint review, we launch directly into our sprint retrospective. Or as I suggested, if possible, schedule a natural break between the sprint review and the sprint retrospective, i.e. a lunchtime or an end of day. Not critical. And if your sprint review is scheduled to start at 1 p.m., which is when we believe the last story is going to be complete, there is no natural break. There's nothing wrong with running the sprint retrospective immediately after the sprint review at 3 p.m and taking our sprint respective out to the end of day. But where possible, I prefer to run my sprint retrospective just after a natural break. And for the reason already discussed is the sprint review is typically happy and energy-based. We've just done a successful show and tell of the eight stories completed in the sprint 
and we're getting nothing but rave reviews from all of the business users, that's a pretty special feeling. And if we go off that happy energy-based review straight into a sprint retrospective where we're supposed to be looking for lessons learned, it can be more challenging to be more critical after the high, but I think we're all professionals, we're all adults, and if there's no possibility for that natural break, then let's do the sprint retrospective at 3 p.m. and finish out the day on the sprint retrospective. The amount of time for a retrospective is basically the same as for a review, is one hour per week of sprint. So in my case, my sprint retrospective is going to take two hours, which is why I say we start the sprint retrospective at 3 p.m. and we run it out to the end of day. So who attends? Unlike the sprint review, which is very open, the sprint retrospective is the team and only the team. And of course, the team includes the product owner and the scrum master and all of the developers. Because the sprint retrospective is internal focused, what did we do that worked? What do we need to do to improve? The only people who should have input into the sprint retrospective is the team itself. Where should it be held? The team workspace is as good a spot as any. Does not have to be. There are those who just suggest that taking it out of the team workspace for two hours is beneficial because we lose all of the focus from these burn downs, the burn ups, we, we take it to a neutral space. So sometimes the neutral is beneficial. Now I'm not saying we go out and rent a meeting room at the local hotel and pay expensive dollars to go to the neutral space, but just find a meeting room at work and take your sprint retrospective outside of the team workspace. I find, again, personally, taking it to a meeting room, a conference room somewhere in my workspace is a better idea for the sprint retrospective. Again, it just takes us out of that team workspace, removes any positive or negatives that we're gonna get from the burn down, the burn up, the, the done charts, et cetera, et cetera, and it takes us to a neutral space. Steve's idea only, not critical. You can have very effective team retrospectives within the team workspace. And there are times that having those reminders, oh yeah, look at that huge blip on our burn down chart on day six. That was because, yeah, there was something really bad happened on day six. So again, pros and cons of doing it inside the workspace or in a neutral site, doesn't matter. Just as I've said earlier, make sure the team retrospective happens after every sprint while the issues are fresh and the resolution can fix before minor issues become ingrained. Bad habits are easy to break early. Once bad hab habits become part of standard process, they're much harder to resolve. Unlike the team sprint review, which is very open-ended and, and, and fluid, I suggest the team retrospective needs to be a little more organized where we need to follow a set agenda. I believe the first critical aspect for a team retrospective is set the goal. We are today going to focus on team dynamics. Yes, there may have been other issues discovered in the sprint, but from what I've seen as the Scrum Master, I think our team dynamics need to be adjusted. We need to focus on what we can do to be more effective as a team. So therefore, I would like to suggest our goal for this particular sprint review to be focused on team dynamics or 
give other team members an option to speak up and says, no, Fred thinks the efficiency of the build server is should be our goal for this particular sprint retrospective. And the reason I'm suggesting we need to set the goal is we only, again, have a limited amount of time. If we sit there and just let every team member focus on whatever it is they think needs to be fixed, we're going to spend our entire two hours and we still haven't come up with a list of all of the problems, let alone some recommended solutions. So, again, Steve's humble opinion, pick a major concern and focus on that, recognizing that the minor concerns will either self-correct themselves or will still exist for the next sprint review in two weeks time, by then might be a little more serious and may need addressing as a major concern. Once we have the goal defined, we need to have focused discussion. Just like the daily scrum, is everybody has to focus on the goal. We don't have time for sidebars. We don't have time for, for oh yeah, I know this is your goal, but this is what I would do. Da, da, da. It needs to be focused discussion. Spending about half of the time on defect identification and then discuss the options. How are we going to fix? And literally brainstorm blue sky. We've now had our open and frank discussion on the problems. Now, anybody, ideas, what can we do about this? How can we improve team dynamics? Do we need to wear the same color t-shirts? Do we need to adjust our work hours? Do we need to find a better time for the daily scrum? Do we need to, do we need to? Throw anything and everything out there. Blue sky, how to fix. Spend about 30 to 40 minutes of your remaining hour discussing the options and then develop the action plans in the remaining 10 minutes. And you're probably going to say, Steve, 10 minutes isn't very long. I've had three day off site facilitated workshops where we've gone through and tried to do process improvement for the organization. And that's the key. It's process improvement for the organization or the department. This is a very focused issue that we have encountered over the last two weeks. So therefore, dealing with all of this in two hours and dealing with our action plans in 10 minutes should be very realistic because we're dealing with the problems early before they're big enough to need a three-day off-site with a facilitator. So 10 minutes to develop the action plans and then 30 seconds, and I'm probably being a little extreme with that definition, 30 seconds to gain commitments to the improvements. So this is what we're going to try. Does everybody agree? Is everybody committed? Is everybody going to come back to work tomorrow morning on our next sprint with the commitment and the energy and the dedication to try to improve these process that we've just discussed? Look for a show of hands, look for the happy faces, look for the noddings, look for whatever it's going to take and move forward. And I've had a lot of me and I in this discussion. The sprint retrospective is primarily the responsibility of the scrum master. The sprint retrospective is absolutely a team process, but because the scrum master is responsible for facilitating the project, facilitating the, the scrum, removing the roadblocks, and what are we talking about in a sprint retrospective but the roadblocks that need to be removed, the scrum master is typically the facilitator for the sprint retrospective, and the scrum master is typically the person who's going to own the action plans and follow up on the commitments to improvements. And finally, a very brief discussion of this scrum terminology called the introspective. And as discussed, the introspective is an on-demand review of issues. This is the whole concept of dealing with problems in their infancy before they in become ingrained and become part of our standard process. So again, traditionally, the introspective is a scrum master 
focused activity, but any team member who identifies, hey, this isn't working. I feel that I'm not being valued by the team, i.e. team dynamics. I feel that the build server is running inefficient. For anything and everything that any team member identifies that is really causing significant concern in the, in the sprint, anyone, but in particular the Scrum Master, because we're looking for the roadblocks and the issues, and being Scrum-like, can call the introspective. And the introspective is, again, the team and the team only. And to repeat myself, the product owner and the Scrum Master absolutely are part of the team. And we go into a focused introspective. And the, the focused introspective basically does the same things we just discussed as part of the retrospective. I change the terminology slightly in each of these instances. So in an introspective, we do issue identification. What's wrong? We don't have to determine what the goal is because the introspective is always focused. So what's wrong? We need to get agreement from the team that the issue exists. So Fred may have identified the issue with the build server. We present it to the team. The team says, yes, you're right. Fred's bang on. We've been all complaining about this. It's time to do something about it. So we get instant agreement that the issue exists. And then we do very honest discussion. Now, if the introspective is being held because the build server is running slow, getting honest discussion is not going to be an answer. But if the introspective has been pulled together because one of the team members says, I feel I'm not being appreciated by the team, I feel I'm being very underutilized, I feel I'm being ignored, we absolutely have to try to pull out open and honest discussion. The team dynamics, using one of the examples already discussed, is critical. And if we can't have open and honest discussion within the team, again, we have reason for an introspective ask everyone to be polite but honest. Once we get the honest discussion, we then identify the actions needed, we develop the action plan, we get commitment, and we proceed. We go back to our desks, we go to work on our stories, and we implement the actions. Focused, short, I hope, sweet, I hope, and designed to deal with problems instantly. And you may say, well, Steve, your sprint is only two weeks long. Surely there's no problems that are going to come up that are so critical that they can't wait for the sprint retrospective in two weeks' time? And the answer is yes. Most times we do not have to call team introspectives. Most times we can make a little yellow sticky and leave it on the corner of our, our desk that says items to discuss in the sprint retrospective. But there will be instances where the item is of such urgency and such criticality that we need to call an immediate on-demand introspective. Do not expect to have an introspective per sprint. If we're having an introspective per sprint, we have a lot of serious problems and we probably need to stop the sprint work and deal with the problems. <clears throat> so again, the expectation we, we don't do an introspective every sprint or every second or third or fourth, we hopefully w may only have to do one or two introspectives across an entire release or even the entire project. And if things are going well, we may never need to do an introspective. But as a scrum master, we should be very aware that the introspective tool exists and be prepared to use it as needed. This nugget on sprint review and sprint retrospective is focused on closing the sprint. We start with the sprint review, which is the show and tell, the demo of every story. and the securement 
of agreement of done. Once the sprint review is complete, we launch immediately into the sprint retrospective where we do lessons learned and process improvements. Each of these activities should be approximately two hours in length for a two-week sprint using the rule of thumb that it's one hour of sprint review and one hour of sprint retrospective for every hour or for sorry for every week of sprint so again my instance is two week sprints two hour sprint review and a two hour sprint retrospective just like our daily scrum we need to be focused we need to ensure they're on time and we need to ensure they achieve their objective which is all about being scrum like and we introduce this concept of an introspective which is simply an on-demand retrospective to deal with any problems that are urgent dealing with them fixing them resolving as soon as they're identified before they become more serious this concludes our nugget on sprint review and sprint retrospective i hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing